my name is Laura and I am the Nerdy Needle. Today's video is a stitch with me on my full coverage project where I use a parking method with needles. I've done a video on this um, several videos ago and so I've put some clarification into this one. And the other thing about this section of my project is um, there's just fewer colors going at the same time. So I thought that there's just less things going on and hopefully that will clarify some things for, um, for my fellow stitchers. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask questions um, in the comments section. I do read all of those. I um, really do appreciate all the feedback. Um, if you are wondering about some of the stuff I'm talking about, I have done some uh, previous tutorials, so go look back in my earlier um, videos. I think I have a series of about four or five um, videos that walks you through my process of um, how I do this stitching and why I do it this way. I'm a science teacher, a high school science teacher, and so I'm always looking to not just explain how I do something, but why um, I do something the way that I do it. So there's plenty of explanations um, for your nerdy side. Um, so this section, there's a lot fewer colors going at the same time. Hopefully that will, um, that will make things a little clearer and I hope you find this helpful. So let me walk you through what all of these different thread categories that I have are. First of all, I have my um, threads that are off to the side right here. These are threads that I've parked for the next diagonal. So that I pull the needles off of these and I drape them across the top of my scroll frame. See how I roll my scroll frame under so that these threads can just kind of sit there. If I scroll it the other direction, then, um, then these have a tendency, the shorter, the shorter parked threads will kind of flop back into my work and that's annoying. Um, I usually put a grime guard up here if any of my stitching is under the bar, but since it's narrower, it doesn't really matter and I haven't bothered. So these are again for my next diagonal and I made some nifty little signs to help orient. So that's my next diagonal with no needles. So I have my current working threads down here. Um, I just finished a row, so I stitch left to right, top to bottom. So these are my, my threads that I'm going to be, it's my right side current thread. So I, it's right because it's on the right side of my, my little thing here, my um, setup. And then as I'm working, as I stitch across this row, and I park my threads for the next row, they're gonna go right over here. So I'm basically, my working threads just get passed from the right side to the left side, to the right side, to the left side. So any needles that are here are the ones that I'm gonna use in my current row. When I park the next row, they're gonna go here. If I have a thread that like say would be like right here, um, actually these, are my threads from my previous diagonal. So these again have no needles on them. So these threads, I put put a clip on them that's got some metal in it because I've got a magnet down here to um, hang on to them so they're not flopping all over the place. So these threads were originally these threads from my previous diagonal. So once I finish this diagonal, I'm gonna take all of these threads from this diagonal and they're all just gonna get shifted down here. Okay, so, and there's actually kind of two categories of threads down here. So these are my previous diagonal threads down here. Now, if I'm stitching and I need to park a thread a little bit farther down, so it's not in the next row, it's like three or four rows down, I'm not gonna put it on my current, my current uh, needle binders. I'm going to leave the needle on and just stash it down here with my previous diagonal thread. So I can just call those my later threads. Um, everything that doesn't say no needles on it, those are all have needles. 
So the only threads that I don't have needles on are basically the threads from my diagonals. So the, the threads from my previous diagonal and then the ones for my next diagonal, which are up here. And I have one more category of threads and um, I have an example for this and it's right here. See, I've just pulled this thread up to the front, uh, left the needle on, and I'm calling that my too much counting um, thread. So basically this thread, I was stitching up here somewhere and this thread I'm gonna need like somewhere down here, but it was like further over and these are long strings of um, colors and there was just nothing to really orient. And I looked at that and I'm thinking, eh, it's too much counting to figure it out down here. So what I did was I just took this thread and just pulled it up to the front so that it's completely out of the way. I only do this every once in a while. I'm not gonna ever have like a bunch of these up here cause it just gets too hard to keep track of. But every once in a while, if I need, um, if I'm gonna need that thread a few rows down but I don't wanna bother trying to count over, then I'll just pull it up to the front I need to remember that that's there. I have forgotten and like started a thread and then I look up here and I'm like, oh, I already had one. Um, so I need to remember that that is there, but it's a um, easy way of just not having to bother counting. And with parking, you know, you have to get the, the counting correct. Otherwise you're gonna have a, you're, you're gonna make mistakes. So um, this is a good solution for that. And we're actually going to come back to that because that's a good solution for something else too. Um, but I'm not going to go there yet. Um, other things that I do, um, here are a couple of waist knots. So that's how I start threads that don't have a loop start on them. And it's also how I end my threads so that I don't have to flip my um, work over because all of this stuff just start, goes flying everywhere. Other things that I have is kind of a pin cushion that's kind of a fuzzy, uh, it's more, it's a needle minder. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't, I got those on eBay probably about six or seven years ago. I've looked, I haven't been able to find any. If anybody has a, a link to um, a needle minder that's got kind of a fuzzy to it so that you can use it as a pin cushion, uh, please let me know because people have been asking about that. Other things, I have my um, needle minder with my um, my needle threader and then a pair of tweezers, which I use to um, grab my waist knots and cut them off. So I just basically grab the tweezers to pull up on that so I can snip off my waist knots. Um, I keep my embroidery scissors down here. Oops. Um, I roll my scroll frame under because it gives me a nice tray and it keeps me from messing up any stitches that might be here, which I don't have yet. Um, and I won't because this is basically gonna be the bottom here. Um, and then I use a trolley needle and I have another video that describes how I do that. So I'm a nation. So currently that's where we're at. Um, so I'm just gonna be stitching. Now I picked this section to demonstrate my parking technique again, because I'm running relatively few threads um, the first video I did on parking, I, I had like about a dozen threads. So that is also a way you can see what happens when you have a bunch of threads going at the same time. Um, I think the most threads that I've ever run has been about 14 or 15, all with needles on them. And it really, I, I don't get tangles with this system. It works beautifully. All right, so let me put my magnification on. And oh, let's go. I need to orient myself. Um, so I took a screenshot of just a few rolls, rows of this pattern. This pattern isn't even in production anymore. And, you know, it's, it's all this. So it's not like it's going to be worth anything for anybody. But I thought that that would be useful for people to see. So let me make sure I'm on camera. So if you're looking at my chart, um, so this is the A color. This is the um, 
those horizontal lines, and this is the sideways M. So those are my colors from my previous park. Um, and let's get going. All right, so I need two of these A's. And my stitching speed when I stitch like this, showing all of you, is slower than it usually is because I can't quite get my head over my work, so it's a little bit harder to see. But um, especially with few colors, I can really I can really crank through stuff. Okay, so those are my two A's and the trolley needle, you can see it's just running over the spike. And what that does is it just lays my threads nice and parallel so that I just get neater stitches. So this is where I need to park. I always start my stitches from the bottom left. So the place you park your thread is the wherever you're starting, wherever you come up the first leg of your stitch. And for me, that's always the bottom left. So here's my, um, this is the A color. And then um, since this is the first color on the next row, I'm going to put it at the bottom. And when I park onto this needle minder, I kind of dig in and kind of feel the plastic scrape the needle. Um, otherwise they, they can fall out and then they get out of order. Okay, and I think I made a mistake. I put this one too far, so I need to... Oh, great, and I just unthreaded my needle. So I've been really excited because I just saw that I reached 500 subscribers today. I was really excited to see that. I'm really kind of so really pleasantly surprised at how much interest there has been and what I have to show. All right. So this is those parallel horizontal lines. If I can hit that hole, come on, there we go. So this thread I'm going to need to end because it's getting kind of short. One thing when you're ending threads with the waist knot, or, um, you know, I don't get every single last possible stitch out of my thread because I need enough to carry behind my work so that I can pull it up. Now I pull up, I, I've been actually making this shorter. I used to come up and like run about 10, 10 rows away, um, or 10 stitches away from where, um, my last stitch was to come up to do my waist knot, but I've actually been shortening that up to about five or six, because I mean, all of these stitches, there's no way this thread's ever gonna come out once I finish um, the rows right here. So basically with the waist knot, um, this is being carried on the back underneath my fabric. I come up, I put a little knot on there to keep it from flopping or pulling through the, um, the fabric. And then as I continue to stitch, I'm going to stitch over that carried thread on the back. So by the time I get down to here, um, that thread is gonna be secured with the rows that have been stitched there. And then I just snip off that waist knot um, and that's it. So I'm going to need this horizontal line um, color again. So, um, I tend to set up my threads for the next um, the next row as I'm stitching across so that they're already there. So I use these master cards. Um, I actually just re-braided um, the tails because they were really messy. Um, this is a great strategy for keeping your thread tails from getting all tangled. And then I just need to pull a thread. Come on, baby.
think I braided this a little too tight because it doesn't want to come out of there. So don't braid your tails too tightly. Come on down. There we go. And then the other thing I do, you see how it's actually not too bad on these thread cards, but you do get kind of kinks in your floss. And um, so what I have is a damp sponge and I just drag my thread through a couple of times to dramp, dampen my floss and see how straight that is now. And that is a fantastic strategy for um, not getting um, slip knots. I very, very, I can stitch for days without getting a single slip knot now. Um, and I'm serious about that. I, I, it's very rare that I get them. And when I look on the back of my work, you've, you've, I mean, it's all happened to all of us where you see that kind of loop where you get a slip knot on the back and it just kind of stays there. And I have very, very few of those because I straighten my floss. So if you've learned nothing else from me today, get a jam, get a piece of sponge. I put it in a one of those French jam jar lids because I have a magnet over here. So it just, I, I can attach it with the magnet and it's always at hand. Um, and it's almost completely wrung out. So if I tried to squeeze this, there wouldn't be any more water that comes out. You kind of have to find the balance between how wet you want it. Um, because otherwise you don't want your thread to get too soggy because you'll notice if you start stitching with thread that's still damp it's going to catch like crazy on the fabric so then you just need to wait like 30 seconds but that's another reason why i um, set up my thread for the next row because then i know that it's for sure going to be completely dry when i need it all right so um I think those are out of order. So now this is my M. And see, I got a little carried away with talking and I didn't realize that I'm gonna need those horizontal line symbols again, but it doesn't matter because I'll just pick them up on the next row. So I'm just gonna skip those completely. And then when I do the next row, I'll pick those up. So I need six of these guys. This is actually kind of the most boring part of this entire project is stitching this, the actual like street of this scene here. So I figure make a video and break up the monotony of just lots of light purple, medium purple, dark purple. Two, three, four, five, six, skip two. And then, so I stitch on the diagonal to avoid any possibility of um, chart lines or column lines. But, you know, on a pattern that's this narrow, that really wouldn't be much of a risk. But um, it's also just a cool way to see your image appear. And so whenever I do full coverage, I just do diagonal because it just looks cool. And it just, it, you get more variation in the color and you get a chance to kind of anticipate the next diagonal. Like when I came to um, up here, I just had a little bit of that dark and I picked up a couple of stitches of the blue. So then I was like, hmm, how's that doorway gonna look? So it's it's just kind of a unique way of, of seeing your image appear, which I really enjoy. And of course this technique would also work with just um, stitching and completing each stitch individually so the official names the this kind of stitching where it's the there and back um, stitching this is called the danish cross and if you complete each stitch individually that is the english cross um, so this this method would work perfectly fine for doing english also and if you're not um so I'm showing you how I stitch because I start in the upper left corner. Um, if you would like to start in a different corner, um, if you go back and look at my video on um, 
how to start in any corner, I will actually walk you through um, how to how you can start in any corner and um, get really nice, neat stitches. So um, I would recommend you go back and check those out. So that's the M. So one of the things, um, because these two colors are very similar, and with this method, I, um, I switch colors so often, like when I was stitching over here, I mean, there, I had like a dozen colors going in 20, in a 20 stitch across row. So it's really easy to forget which stitch did I just forget a finish, what color did I just do. And I don't want to be looking under my work to figure out what's in my hand, because right now I have a thread in my hand underneath my fabric. So how do I figure out um, where I am so that I can park for the next row? I'm going to zoom you in if I can, as much as I can. So I'm not sure, um, you might need to zoom in a bit more for yourself. But what I do is I basically just um, gently tug on the thread underneath and you can see it dimpling the fabric right there. So that's how I know that that's where my thread is right now. I don't know if you can see that. Ow, and I just, <laughs> I just stuck the tapestry needle right in my thumb. Brilliant. Okay, so oh, that's not I'm right here. So now I've got my green. Um, I have my started um, parallel line thread, and this is the sideways M. Oops, I better zoom out. So that goes here. Those two stitches that I just skipped. Um, if I had been paying attention, I would have done the I would have done these with the parallel horizontal lines uh, color, and then did these, and then come back and completed all of that. But because I was too busy yakking away, I forgot about them. But I'm going to need that color anyway. So as I go across here, I'm just going to pick those two up and continue on. And I need. Another color, which is this, I already had it threaded. This is the equal sign, so it's a lighter purple. So my next row, so now I've finished this row. These needles are all in order for doing the next row. So this is no longer my next row. It is, where did I put that? I have all my nifty little labels. So this is now my current row, and this is going to be my next row parked threads. Okay, the other thing I need to do is I've got some waist knots that I've worked my way down to. So these thread, these waist knots right here are the ends of some threads that got ended somewhere up here. So they're all getting carried under the fabric and um, brought up to the front and I placed a knot on there to keep them from falling through. And so now I just snip these off and that's what the tweezers are for. So I just pull up on that, snip. There we go. And often that leaves a bit of a fuzz of that thread kind of sticking into the hole of the Ada. So I use this thing, which is called a snag nabbit. And I just, these, these ones, it doesn't really need it, but I thought I'd show you. Um, so I just put it in there and you can hear it. It's got that rough end to it, which just snags the um, fuzz and pulls it through to the back side. Uh, this is a fantastic tool. Um, you, I mean, it's impossible to not pull through some fuzz to the front 
and then you just grab this and push your threads through. Or if you're seeing some, you know, a different color fuzz coming through, you can just get rid of it using this. Fant one of my, my all time favorite tools. Okay, so cross off this row on my chart. And so I layered, so my, when I put my, my needles, um, it's really important to put them in the correct order and it's, go it's bottom to top, left to right. So now that I've got everything here, I need to be able to grab my first needle, which is this one. The thread for that is on the bottom. So if you basically, this is what I call flipping the threads and I'm just gonna do it slowly. So if you just take all of your threads that were layered down here and just invert them, then now your first thread is, or your first needle is ready to go. So you basically, um, all of these were down like that and I just flip all my threads up and um, now everything is accessible and I can keep going. Now you might see that I put my needles facing to the right and I'm gonna do it the same over here when I park over here. And it's because I'm left-handed, hand, I'm left -handed, so my left hand is under my fabric. So I'm pulling these needles with my right hand, so I might as well point them in the direction that I can make it so that it's easy to grab them. So this is the letter A. I need three of these. And so with the laying tool, all I'm doing is, as I'm pulling through, I just put a little bit of tension on that thread as it goes through to the, as I'm pulling through to the back. Um, so it's almost like I'm just putting a little bit of a break as I, on the thread as I'm pulling down. So a little bit of tension, but that's all. So that A goes there. And now I pull my park on my next row um, needle minder, and it's going to be on the bottom. And now I started the parallel line thread, which is this one. I need two of those here. And I'm using the loop method. Um, the way I set up my threads, I um, my thread length is 100 centimeters. So basically, I um, I take a skein of DMC and um, basically fold it in half four times. So I make eighths of the eight meter skein. So each thread is one meter long, um, which is a little bit on the long side, but because I don't go to the very end because I use waist knots, um, I haven't noticed that at the end of my, like the, the end of my threads, I don't really notice that it, things are getting all that worn. So, um, it's, I, I, I haven't seen any problems with doing this. Okay. So skip one, four, five, six, seven. It's really weird how even just a slight different angle to looking at my stitches and it's harder to see. So now I'm just going to pick up those two that I forgot about and I'm going to come in from the top. Even if I hadn't come down here, I would come in from the top to get a, a thread direction change so that um, I get neater, neater stitches. And if you're like, what is she talking about with thread direction change? Um, go 
uh, I think it's my second video where I talk about how to make your stitches pretty. Um, that's where I talk about that. And I'm really noticing on this pattern because I've been really careful about that and it does make a big difference. Okay, just need to go back. And you can see that, no, do I get every single stitch? Do I manage to use my trolley needle, my laying tool? No, but I do most of them. Sometimes I miss. So that one is the one with the, the horizontal lines. So I need to park over here. Is that right? Yeah. And I think I've got something going on here. Let's figure out what's going on. So this is a thread that I parked from the previous diagonal. And I suspect that there's some sort of mistake here because that's this guy. So this is M. So I think I just parked it in the wrong hole. Um, I don't, sometimes I miss with my parking, but most of the time I get it right, but this one I missed. So what do I do if I suspect that I've missed, misparked my thread? Um, I just do a color comparison to identify what, what the actual color is. Um, so I would just grab my threads and it's not that one, it's this one. Nope, not that one either. <laughs> It's on the other side. Here it is. So it's either going to be this one, this one, or this one. Those are the three colors I'm running right now. These two, that's not it. So this is M. So this is my M. And so it needs to be on the other side of this. So basically, as I stitch a row, I'm kind of anticipating my next row and that setting everything up for the next row. So now I've got my M. Need to make sure this needle's parked. And then this one. This one is also an M. So that does happen where, um, so I don't, I don't, put, I don't mark on my chart where I've parked threads. I found that that's just, I, there's really no need for it um, because I can start and end threads so easily. Um, in this situation, there's two solutions. So let me get the seat stitch. And then looking ahead in my chart, I'm looking to see how much of this M color, the sideways M color I have, and there's not a whole lot of it. But let's pretend that there was a bunch of this. Um, so if there was a bunch of this M, then this is also an M, and this thread that I, this one that I just did, that I'm using right now is also an M. So let's say that like I had like, 10 stitches of M right here. What I would do is I would just divvy it up between this thread and this one. So I would just come up like halfway through that run and just run two needles with the same color. 
Um, I've done that quite a bit and um, it's, it's really no more work and that means that I don't have to um, pull, a, pull a thread as often because I've got two needles running the same color. Um, but because I don't really need this color very much and since I have this parked thread here, um, the other thing I would look at is which one is the longer thread and I would end the shorter one, but both of these are about the same length. So I'm just gonna end this one, come up to the front, put a knot. And snip. So either one works. If there's a bunch of the color, then split the duty up for that color between two needles running the same color, or just end it. And then the way that I um, store my needles, uh, this is a Paco needle organizer. Um, and you can see that that's definitely the issue with this system is that you do use a lot of needles. And you can see that like I actually have multiple needles with the same color. Um, and then I just grab them off of here and off I go. Um, and let's say that I was needing to start this color. What I would do is just put a, a knot on the end um, and basically reverse the waist knot process. So I would make a knot come down say right about there let's say i needed that green color right there i would i would put a knot on the end come down there come up here start stitching and then it would just be a waist knot just like uh, these guys all right long explanation now this is the equal sign And this just goes to the end of the row. I'm hoping this is, hopefully this is turning out. I've, it's always a bit challenging setting up my phone to record and to get decent light without like monster shadows. I did a I did one recording and the lighting was really weird and um, some shadows everywhere. It doesn't work very well that way. I'm really liking this pattern. This is the first spot where I'm kind of getting a little annoyed with it because it is just a lot of this purple, shades of purple and um, lavender. It's getting a little old, but the rest of it's been great. And I really enjoy the architectural aspect of it with just these straight lines. Um, my last big full coverage piece was a field of flowers, so there wasn't, there were no lines in it anywhere, straight lines. And this one, it's been kind of fun. Um, and what's really cool about this is that, like, when you get really close to it, you can't really see the features. Like, as close as I'm sitting right now, I can't really tell that this is a doorway, but when you get a little bit further from it, you can totally see the three-dimensional um, look to it, which I really like. All right, so that's the equals, and that needs to go all the way out. So this is my, this is the horizontal lines. This is the M. I need two of those, and this is the equals. So now I've got everybody, uh, my row is complete. I've got everybody parked. So now I go backwards. So now um, this is my current row. And then this is gonna be my next row. Okay, and so again, 
the way that I layer my threads as I go across, everything just layers on top of each other. So this was my, this is my last thread. And the green one is at the very bottom. So um, with more threads, that's why I have a laying tool here. You can also just kind of grab the threads um, and just flip them up like that. And it doesn't need to be neat at all because um, they don't really tangle. And so the only thing I pay attention to is making sure that I can, uh, that my needles are seated, that they're not flopping out like this one is trying to make a run for it. So make sure that's seated, that they're not, the threads aren't looped around each other and then I can easily grab the needle. And pulling off of the needle minder, um, the key to that is to grab the needle and not the thread. If you grab the thread, you're just going to unthread your needles and you're going to end up with a mess. And... See, I talking and stitching at the same time can be a little challenging. We're gonna get this done and then figure out what my what color that is. Hoping it's my equal. Okay, park down there. All right, so. My too much counting thread up here. Um, I'm wondering what color is this my, yeah, this is, uh, this color up here. Let's, that is the equals. So, if I hadn't been talking to all of you, I probably would have realized that this is the equal. So this is this color right here. So basically, this, um, I was up here, so I did those three, and then I would have been one, two, three rows down and a bit over, and I didn't want to bother counting that. So that's why I put the put this in my just pulled it up to the front. Um, so this this thread is carried behind and it's completely out of the way of my stitching. So I'm being careful that I can access this thread and I'm not stitching over the top of it because then I would then then this point it would be pointless to do this. But because it's being carried up like this, it's complete. It's it's perfectly fine. Um, and so I can access this thread. So originally the plan was for me to pull this up right there and stitch that row, but because I was yapping away, I forgot to do that. But because this is the equals and um, this is the equals, I'm gonna, and I have a bunch of equals in that row, I'm just gonna dub, I'm just gonna pull this down here in a little bit and just split the, do the equals uh, color between two needles. So you'll see what I mean here in a sec. Okay, so I got my green. And I just have one of these. This is the M. Kind of came up wonky in that hole. Let's see if I can get it. 
you get it to lay a little better. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh well. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So here's my sideways M. And here's my equals. And I have one, two, three, four. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do some with this needle. Let's just do like four. I have some there, and I've got one down there. Yeah, I'm just going to do, eh, let's just do one more. So I'm just going to excuse my head so I can see that. Um, come back down. And then, so this is the same color. Um, and this carried thread is now just from up here down to here. So I'm not really carrying it that far. Again, it was just because I didn't feel like doing a bunch of counting. Because I'm lazy sometimes. There's a mistake in there, but it doesn't really matter when it's like, you know, it's just kind of a jumble of colors like this. If you don't get every stitch exactly per, like in the right spot, doesn't matter too much. So now you've seen how you can run two needles with the same color and basically just split a longer run of colors between the two. Um, I'm not using my laying tool on this because it's so short. So what the laying tool does is as you're stitching up and down through the fabric, the um, thread gets twisted around itself. And so instead of your stitches laying nice and parallel like that, they kind of overlap and that makes for a more irregular stitch. So if you can get them to lay parallel, you're going to get um, neater, prettier stitches. But when your thread is this short, um, I kind of paid attention to it for a little bit. There's really not a whole lot of twisting that's happening anymore. So um, once your thread gets to, you know, kind of short so that it's hard to get that laying tool in there, I just stop doing that. And I think I'm just going to end this. So there's not a whole lot left of it. I tend not to, the other reason I don't like parking, like, really short threads is because they start falling out of my needle minder um, and then it just gets to be a problem all right and i have the next color is that minus sign um so Oh, I just broke that one. Hmm. 
that front one too. Oh well. Uh, don't braid your tails tightly. I I braided them too tightly, and so they're snagging. So I'm gonna have to loosen that up, but not right now. that minus sign and you can kind of hear the, heard it kind of rough coming through the fabric that very first pull it's because it was still a little bit damp but it's pretty warm in here so it dries off real quick So I'll finish this row and then I'll point out a couple of things and we'll call it good. And if you have any um, specific things you'd like me to show, um, just leave a message in the comments and I do pay attention to those and answer as many as I, as I can. Um, and I've kind of got a list of things people have been asking for. Uh, so, and I'm getting pretty quick with being able to do these videos. So they're, the setup is, is like five minutes. So, and I don't do like a million takes anymore because I just leave all my mistakes in there because, hey, we're all human. Um, two over. All right. So I just continue on going back and forth um, in the same manner. Um, so again, these threads down here that are clipped, um, oops, don't do that. Um, these are from my previous diagonal. I didn't have any this time, but let's say that if I say this equal sign, um, if it didn't need, let's say that it needed to be like one row down. So instead of going down, the, um, coming up there, it's one row down. If it was that way, it would not get parked into my next row um, needle minder. I would actually pull that up, leave the needle on there and just stick it to my clip. So the clip gets magnetized because it's on a magnet. So it'll just get stashed down there um, with the needle on it. And then when I get to that row, I just pull that up back into my working, um, my working threads, my current threads. Um, so one thing I wanted to show you, because I have a good illustration of it here, is, um, and I've talked about this in other videos, um, my last big full, full, um, Full coverage, full coverage project, project. I had a I little, had a issue, little and issue, it's very, and it's very, very little, and I have to get like look very closely and be able to be able to see it. But one thing that I did notice was that if you carry a very dark thread behind some very light colored threads um, using a waist knot, um, you can kind of see that. Um, so. So for example, need my pointer. Um, so if I'm stitching this very black up here, this is, this is black. And let's say that I um, used a waist knot for it. And so none of this is stitched yet. And I'm ending this thread and I, I pulled up right here there's a good chance that you're going to see a very, very slight shadow underneath these threads because remember that this stitching isn't here yet. So that carried thread on the back is up against the back of the fabric. And all of these stitches 
on the back are going to layer on top of it. So that black thread is right up against the back of the fabric and that can potentially be visible. So the thing that I've been paying attention to on this project is with very dark colors, so like the black with these really dark blues with some of this dark brown, is paying attention and completely avoiding any risk of carrying a dark colored thread underneath light colors. So one of the ways I do that is I end with a pin stitch um, or start with a pin stitch or the loop method um, so that there is no carried thread. But down here, where was that? It was right here. So down here, I had two bits of black. So I started this black color here with a pin stitch. And if you uh, would like to know about pin stitches, a couple of videos ago, I did a tutorial on starting and ending your thread, flip your work over. So you can go check that out. So I started with a pin stitch, stitched all of this, and then I saw, well, I need the black down here. But because I'm being very, very excessively careful of carrying a dark color behind, um, behind potentially light colors, what I did was I took the very last color wherever I ended up, I think it was right there, and I did the too much counting trick. So basically it's not, that's not just like pulling up just off to the side out of the way. This is also my dark thread carried solution. So to avoid having a carried thread up against the back of my fabric that could potentially be visible, what I did was once I got to here, I took that, that thread and pulled it up to the front, just off to the side, and stitched, stitched, stitched until I needed that dark color again, and then I came back and stitched. And uh, what's going to fall? Let's take a look on the back. Uh, where is it? Ah, it's right there. So... Things are starting to fall. Let's see here. So you can see it's right here. And there's no risk of this being visible because all of this, all of the other colors are underneath it. Now, the likelihood that that was going to ever be visible with this dark color, it wouldn't have. But honestly, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention as to what colors I was going to be running into. And this is a really easy solution for that. So if you're running a very, very dark color, I did it here too. Um, oops. I did it here. So if you're running um, a very dark color and you want to carry it over to another spot to avoid any possible risk of it being visible on the front as a kind of a it looks a little bit dirty or like there's a slight shadow. Um, just pull it up out of the way, leave the needle on, stitch down to where you need it next, pull it out, and then, and then just keep stitching. And then your carried thread is laid on top of all of your other threads. And that problem is completely gone. So that was my other um, little solution for... Um, managing that. And that is me being like super, super picky. Um, but I'm a scientist and so I'm always looking to improve my skills and um, make, make my projects prettier and prettier and identify where my, um, where, how I can fix problems. I'm a troubleshooter, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So when I identify some sort of problem, I'm constantly looking to see how I can fix that problem and that was my solution. So again, you just pull up to the front and then um, you can come back and use that thread. I rarely, rarely do that. Probably this entire project, I've done it like three or four times, but it's a nifty trick. Um, so between not wanting to count a bunch and avoiding that thread, that um, carried thread potentially being visible, uh, that's a good trick for doing that. So I hope this clarified some questions people had about how I use my um, 
my uh, needle parking method, um, it really does speed up stitching immensely. Like this project, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's fully rolled under. So it's, this thing is about this tall. Um, I think it's around 20,000 stitches, 18,000 stitches or something like that. And honestly, I've been working on this for maybe three months, four months, um, probably since February. So March, April, May. Yeah, about three months. And it's not, and I'm, I'm using it in a rotation. So um, it's not that I'm all about stitching quickly, but it is nice to see the results of your labor. And this, um, this just speeds things up and it's super enjoyable. So I hope you find this helpful.